introduce you. Hello, this is Toby Thaler, Vice Chair of the 36th District Democrats. We're interviewing Andrew Lewis for position seven, seat seven in the Seattle City Council. And we have uh, two minutes for your introduction. It's all yours. Toby, thank you so much. Uh, so it's great to be here seeking a second term on the Seattle City Council representing District 7. Uh, and it's always a homecoming coming back to the 36th District Democrats. The, the only overlap, I think, in this committee to the committee that considered me four years ago is Sherry. So I appreciated your comment in the introduction of still treasure. It's, it's good to see you and see you in that leadership position. Um, although I would say I've been involved in the 36th District long enough to have served on the board with Toby Thaler pre last redistricting cycle uh, when Toby was last in the 36th district. So it, it that's it's a throwback and I'm glad um, Toby to see you here in, in leadership again in the 36th with that dividing line changing. Um, uh, so as I said, I'm running for a second term on the Seattle City Council. Uh, the um, uh, focus of my campaign is to continue to build diverse coalitions uh, of people who initially, you might not necessarily think they agree on things, but when you really drill down to it, you can build uh, amongst interest groups and fellow members of the council on um, programs that move people from the street into housing, programs that build alternative civilian responses to um, the police, um, programs that advance uh, decarbonization and electrification of transportation and buildings. The things that we need to meet our goals on public safety, on homelessness, on affordability in the city of Seattle, and on making progress on climate, uh, the looming and most exigent crisis that we collectively face. Uh, if I'm reelected to this position, I'm going to continue to lead in building those coalitions among labor, business, and my colleagues on the council to advance those priorities. And I'm happy to save the balance of this for. Uh, follow-up questions among the board members. And with that, I will hand it back over to the moderator. So question number one will be asked by Jasmine. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, question number one, what steps will you take to ensure that the city remains safe for all, including Black, Indigenous, and LGBTQ people, while keeping police accountable to elected leadership and community? The first thing that we need to do is make sure that every time someone calls 911, an appropriate emergency response is dispatched to deal with any and every crisis that a community member faces. That doesn't always require a badge and a gun. There are many circumstances uh, we know <laughs> uh, where the police officer is not the appropriate first responder. And that really needs to be the first part of this question. Uh, we know nationally and locally that uh, in many cases, um, a gun and a badge officer responding to a certain public health related crisis, be it behavioral um, uh, mental health uh, or be it substance addiction, can sometimes escalate and result in that community member being seriously injured or killed uh, due to the interaction with an officer. Uh, and we know, and it's been, it's debatable uh, that the number of responses that we could hand off to alternative civilian responders could be anything from 12%, which is the number we agree on between the police department, the city council and all parties agree that at least 12% uh, and reports from Nick Jr. and other entities that estimate it could be nearly half. So there's a big delta there and a lot of reform that we can do to increasingly civilianize our first response. We also need to make sure that we hold the line as a Seattle city council uh, through our function on um, the LRPC and really emphasizing that we want accountability, that we want accountability along the lines of the 2017 accountability ordinance, that that is what we insist for in bargaining and that we insist for um, to make sure that when there is uh, an abuse of power um, by a law enforcement officer, they're held accountable. Uh, we also need to make sure, uh, like, you know, now that I've kind of gone through the civilian response alternatives, we also need to make sure that we have a police department that is adequately resourced and prepared to respond to things that only the police can respond to, including crimes of violence and severe property crimes. There's a role for the police, but it isn't everything. Okay. I think you've got a little extra time, but not much. Uh, number two will be asked by Alex. 
Hello, council member. The second question is, how would you ensure that the city has an updated climate action plan and what specific actions would you prioritize to get us back on track to meeting Seattle's Green New Deal goals? So I'll try to do this one a little quicker to make up for if I did get a little additional time on the last one. Uh, but I think it really comes down to when you look at the audit of the CO2 that we are emitting, what are we doing to increasingly electrify our built environment? And then second, what are we doing to invest in uh, public transportation that effectively knocks down uh, the CO2 from single occupancy vehicles? So on the first part on buildings, I'm really proud to have prime sponsored uh, legislation to mandate that all new commercial construction um, be electrified. Um, so if you're building a new commercial building in the city of Seattle, it has to be electric. Uh, you can't use natural gas um, or other fossil fuel heating. Uh, also really, really proud um, to have co-sponsored the same mandate for residential construction. Um, it starts with our built environment, and that's what we need to work on. On transportation, we need to make sure we continue to invest in fast, reliable mass transit, be it uh, grade-separated light rail or metro. Um, I'm an avid transit user. user. I want to continue to invest in that through our transportation benefit district, and that's one of the primary ways the city um, engages in that. Uh, we also need to figure out ways to subsidize and encourage folks to use emerging alternative transportation methods like uh, the increasing popularity and availability of electric bikes. Um, I am personally in the market as a consumer to um, transition to my own electric bike to do uh, um, more of my around the neighborhood errands. Um, I think it's a great way uh, to increase um, our efforts to, de to decrease our dependence on fossil fuel-based transportation. And those are a couple of my um, suggestions as we move into a new term of really focusing on this critical issue. Thank you very much. Uh, third question will be Jenny. You're on mute. Are you on mute? But I unmuted myself, something. Mine keeps mooting itself. Um, the Move Seattle levy is set to expire at the end of 2024. The next nine-year transportation levy will go before the voters in November 2024 to begin in 2025. What investments and improvements would you prioritize for the next transportation levy? Well, it's really important that we uh, dig into a lot of the planning that we've already done to fully realize things like our uh, Seattle bike master plan. We need to make sure that we have infrastructure that is protected for people who are walking and rolling around the city. Uh, we need to make sure that vision zero is, is something that is a heightened priority in the next round of investments for our transportation levy. Um, and really focusing on those areas that data has shown us are the most likely to be places where our neighbors, our family members, or us ourselves could potentially be seriously injured or killed um, as a pedestrian or a biker because of insufficient engineering and structural improvements in a given intersection. Uh, a lot of those improvements are not super expensive. Uh, using a vehicle like the Move Seattle Levy, we can really make a lot of progress on those priorities. And that's something that'll be a really, really big focus of mine. Uh, we also can't lose sight of the fact that our competitiveness internationally as a trade and port city comes from freight mobility and the capability of our infrastructure. And that means essential investments in our multimodal bridges. You know, I, I know I've, I've clashed with some of my urbanist friends over the course of the past four years over, over my support for investments in multimodal bridges. Um, I really think it's an and and, not an and or with these other priorities for um, uh, the multimodal improvements and the Vision Zero improvements I really deeply personally care about as someone who gets around town biking and walking most of the time. But we also need to realize that uh, our competitiveness as a, a maritime industrial port is dependent on freight mobility. It's dependent on the condition of our bridges. Our bridges are in really poor shape and we're gonna need to have that be a big portion of the levy. So those are um, uh, a couple of the big areas of focus, um, but you know, there, there's many more that in a short answer session, uh, I can't accommodate again in the future. Well, good, I don't have to ask about bridges. Uh, number four will be Shep. Do you have a vested interest in those, Toby? <laughs> <laughs> um, 
The city has been in a homeless in a homelessness state of emergency since 2015, yet our homelessness crisis has not receded. What are we doing wrong, and what steps will you take to address the crisis? So the first thing we need to really do is master the fundamentals and the basics. Uh, we have a crisis right now of our service providers not being able to get their contracts on time, and that's resulting in our service providers having to dig into their reserves, in some cases having to borrow, in some cases having to truncate their services or lay off um, people they're hiring or delay hiring. Uh, first and foremost, that is unacceptable. We need to strengthen the system that we have. We need to make sure that the providers that we that are currently doing this work can stay in their position and be adequately paid before we can do anything big, bold, or new. That is the first thing, is, is just making sure that the bedrock that people depend on is sound. Um, second, we need to invest in near-term things that can get people out of encampments now. Not get people out of encampments in five years, and 10 years, but get people out of encampments now. We have things that we know people will accept if we can offer them. And they'll accept them because they're better than encampments and it gives us breathing space as we build towards the permanent housing we all know is the ultimate way to get us through this homelessness crisis. That includes things like tiny house villages, enhanced shelters, and hotel motel acquisition. Things that an overwhelming majority of the people experiencing homelessness, if, if we could scale those kinds of offerings, we would not have an encampment crisis. And that would buy a considerable amount of goodwill to continue to make the permanent supportive housing investments that are necessary, that everyone in our community has a permanent place to live and a permanent place where they are cared for. These are the things that I've consistently, doggedly, and enthusiastically pushed for over the course of the last four years. Um, I am looking forward to an opportunity to work with incoming new leadership at the King County Regional Homelessness Authority and emphasize those priorities, um, given the news today. And I'm looking forward to continuing to work with my colleagues from the council and Mayor Carroll around those shared areas of concern to build progress on this exigent crisis of homelessness. Uh, thank you very much. And now we have the chance for follow-up questions. I will call on people by hand. Uh, you better go quick because I'm going to hit my hand button pretty soon. Uh, oh, I didn't see you, Jeremy. Go ahead. All right. How um, so you you bring up uh, multimodal bridges as um one as one of the uh, one of the priorities. Um, and I I mean I I under I understand where you're coming from here and and understand that. My question though is when we're building these projects. I mean, a, a very good recent example, this new Elliott Way uh, highway, um, do, you know, the but the road is open now, the bike lane later. Um, how do we stop um, the bike and pedestrian infrastructure parts of these projects from becoming an afterthought? Yeah, Jeremy, really great question. I think that in that particular example, what it really comes down to is the generational shift in how we think about these investments. Uh, when we planned those projects, I mean, I say we in the general sense, like I was not obviously in any way involved. It was over a decade ago. Um, like our transportation planning had completely different priorities. Vision Zero was not a concept, let alone city policy. Uh, we unfortunately live in this world um, that I struggle with all the time on the city council where it is it is impossible to wrench into something that was decided decades ago to make tweaks uh, as we're getting close to implementation, right? Like we, we are enacting policy decisions that were made by completely different councils that are binding and with funders with, with funds that have been committed. So with that particular, God, already, with that particular circumstance, um, like it wouldn't happen again today. We need to make sure our planning is pedestrian and bike on board. And I think under the current leadership, we're getting that way with director spots. Okay. Uh, moderator privilege, I will ask. I'm asking this follow up question of all city council candidates. Inclusionary housing is explicitly allowed by the recently passed state level missing middle zoning bill to help ensure production of more low income housing in every community. How would you support using it in Seattle? 
So what we need to really look at, as with anything where the government is trying to incentivize actions by private actors in the economy, is how can you leverage incentives and mandates to get the result that you want to see? And when it comes to housing development, we have a multi-layered um, uh, set of mandates. I alluded to some of them. The new energy code updates, that's a mandate on someone who's building housing. Uh, mandatory housing affordability, that's a mandate. I think what we really need to look at is the accounting of what do we want to see. And Toby, to your point, like I agree, like what we want to see to read between the, the premise of your question, we want to see people to perform on site and build housing in our neighborhoods in an integratory way. So how can we leverage the advantages of House Bill 1110 and maybe streamline some of the other things that we require as a state to make sure that the overall package is one that would incentivize you if you're going up, say, to six units on a parcel to have a portion of those, a significant portion, be affordable? Okay, thank you for that. And I see Jasmine has her hand up. Yeah, I had a different question, but I'll want to also bounce off of uh, Jeremy and um, the conversation uh, when it comes to like Elliott Way is I think there is that generational mindset, but then I also wonder because what we ended up seeing a lot of was that there were these great plans and this pedestrian forward um, picture that they painted and then continued to post. But then when, what we saw from the starting point, those designs, and what we ended up with are um, very different and start picture. So wondering beyond the generational attitude set, making sure that if we are putting pedestrians first and that multimodal um, focus first, that there's that consistency from that in, initial design through to uh, the end product. Yeah, one of the things that uh, I asked of um, uh, our director, um, Angela Brady of the Waterfront um, in the hearing where we were discussing Ziza Lalich way and the renaming was um, where does the state begin and the city, or where does the state end and the city begin in terms of the power of the right of way? And it's basically a yesler. And the only reason I highlight that is I think it would be best for us at this point, especially with the looming opportunities that are presented by the Move Seattle levy, to think of some of these pieces of infrastructure to a certain extent as a blank canvas. Uh, there's no reason why we can't eventually transition at that portion of, of Elliott into like a wall walk or something of that nature. There's no reason why we can't um, uh, pursue increased pedestrian and multimodal improvements because we own that right away and we don't have to check with the state for anything that's north of Yesler. So we just need to continue to keep an emphasis on it and, and not close any doors. Are there any further follow-up questions? You. Alex has his hand up and Jasmine. Uh, it's hard to see. Alex, go ahead. Hi, council member. Originally, I was going to ask you a question about bridges, but Jeremy beat me to it. So instead, I want to know, um, if reelected, what committee would you be interested in serving in and why? Um, so I, I don't know how much I want to put a target on my back with my colleagues here uh, in, in terms of the jostling. I, I guess what I would just say is um, it's been a really great privilege over the course of the past four years to serve as a member of the finance committee um, and to really drive a lot of our priorities as relates to the overall city budget. Um, it's really where a lot of stuff comes together for the structural and transformative change of the city and continuing to have an ability to lead in that capacity um, is something that would be um, really valuable uh, to my team and I and the constituents I work with in the district. Uh, you know, I've also had a very strong interest in evolving public safety policy over the course of the past four years, and that's something I, I intend to continue to lead on, regardless of what committee I'm chairing. Um, and there's certainly unfinished business with homelessness. Uh, so, so, you know, I, I think those are the policy areas I'm going to continue to work on, um, regardless of what committee I'm, I'm actually serving on. Well, we're out of time for follow-up questions, but you have a minute of closing time if you want. Uh, well, thank you so much. It's really good to join everyone here this evening, and, and I look forward to uh, addressing the broader membership 
as part of the endorsement process. Uh, as someone who used to be an elected PCO, um, but now is ably uh, represented by Shep uh, and, and not seeking to contest a PCO ship, um, uh, I have great appreciation for the 36th District Democrats. I have um, been a consistent uh, involved member of the 36th District for many, many years through several redistrictings and, and very grateful to continue to stay within it. Um, I will continue to bring those democratic values to the Seattle City Council dais and work with my colleagues to make progress on our shared um, values and policy concerns. And I'm always available to answer any follow-up questions, uh, make myself available to um, uh, engage in any shared project. And, uh, you know, like I said at the beginning of this, it always feels like a family homecoming to a certain extent. I've grown up with the 36th District Democrats and I continue to avidly be involved uh, in the party building of the 36th as long as I am an elected official. So thank you. Thank you. Hey, that will, we will close the recording and